be seated. This morning's scripture reading comes from 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 22. I'll let you turn there. 2 Peter 2, beginning in verse 1. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, herald of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ash and condemning them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as uh, as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passions and despise authority. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones, whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their destruction, in their deceptions, while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They they have hearts trained in greed, accursed children, forsaking the right way. They have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing but was rebuked for his own transgressions. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them to never have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit. And the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. And this is the inerrant and infallible word of our Lord. If you would, please bow your heads as we take a moment to pray. Father, we stand in awe of your goodness and your mercy this morning. You are, you are always more ready to hear than we are to pray and to give more than we desire or even deserve. Please pour down upon us the, the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience has convicted us and, and giving us those good things for which we are, we are not worthy to ask, except through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. 
May we know the presence of the Holy Spirit here with us today, and may we be open to your leading and sensitive to your speaking and alert to your calling. God, as we turn to your scriptures, send your Holy Spirit to infuse your word with truth and grace so that the good news of your love would shine before our eyes and delight our very senses and so that we could we could not help but respond with wonder, faith, and trust. In Christ's name we say, Amen. So we're... We're making an audible. You're probably looking at your bulletin and it says Jude 1 through 4 and that the message is to contend. That is not true. It will be Jude 5 through 7 and I'm horrible at giving messages titles so if you have to have a title, just title it. He's going to cut them down. But brothers and sisters in Christ, I want to make an announcement to you. It should not be a surprise in any form or fashion, and that is this, is that Johnny Cash was right. Now, for those of you who don't know, Johnny Cash is not a theologian, and he's not a minister or a preacher, but most of you would know he's a musician and a singer, and Johnny Cash was right. And I know this isn't the theological truth that you came here this morning expecting to hear, but we're and you're probably anticipating that we continue with Jude. As I said, we left off at Jude 4, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to continue exactly where we left off today, going through verses 5 through 7. And by the end of the message, I'm going to explain to you how Johnny Cash was right. But as a point of review, let me remind you of some of what we have covered so far in our Series that if you didn't know we're in a series, yes, we've done two messages, and we'll, and Lord willing, just continue on through Jude until we come to the end. We began the series in Jude, Jude's greeting. In his greeting, we heard the gospel message. Jude began by by exhorting us, by by giving us the gospel message, and we discovered that we're to be reminded of the gospel before we're exhorted to contend for the gospel. And if you are a Christian here this morning, it is because you've been graciously and and personally and, and effectually called by God himself through the proclamation of the gospel. If you are a Christian, it is because God has called you. And if you've been called by God the Father, it is because you are loved by God the Father. And if he loves you, he will assuredly keep you. And that was the first message that we heard. And when we looked at Jude's exhortation to contend, that was the second time, we discovered that that it's a special call to action. It's a call to contend for the gospel of Christ. And why must we contend? Whenever an instruction is given, sometimes it's good to ask why, to see what that's connected to. And when we ask why, we find out this. It's because the body of Christian truth, which, which Jude calls the faith, is the treasure of God given to the church. It is the church's great treasure because by it, People are saved and and taken from the abject poverty of of sin and given the riches of eternal life in Christ. And because the enemies of the gospel, there are enemies, Jude says, who have crept in and they've crept into our very own camp. And so I gave this example. We're not to be on the ramparts of the castle looking at a foreign enemy who might be storming the gates, but instead we're to turn around and look in because that's where the enemies are. They've crept in. They're inside the gate. And so when we contend for the faith, it is mostly from the ramparts looking in and us watching. It's not only against erroneous teaching, but it's against sinful behavior amongst professing Christians that Jude calls us to to battle when he calls us to contend for the faith. To to, To contend for the faith means concerning ourselves with Christian duty as well as Christian doctrine. And that's where we left off. In our previous two messages. And so, if you would look with me, we're going to look at Jude 
starting in verse 1, going to verse 7. That will be our reading for today, but we're going to focus mostly on verses 5, 6, and 7. So if you would, please follow along. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus who saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterwards destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. And just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued a natural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. And this is the word of the Lord. And so Jude, having told us his purpose, was to urge the saints to contend for the faith once delivered. He does not immediately, you'll, you'll kind of notice, he doesn't immediately tell you how to do this, how to contend for the faith, but instead what Jude does is he proceeds to give three Old Testament examples of, of God's judgment against sin. Three dramatic, unforgettable, historical illustrations of sin and, and how it ends. And again, it's always good. Why? Ask why. Why does he do this? He, he gives us three biblical examples in order that we, being warned about the fate of these false teachers, might strongly resist them. That's why he does it. So let us begin to focus on our text today. We're, we're going to move through our text and look at these three examples in the time that we have this morning. But there's three words that I want you to, to remember throughout today's message. And there are going to be stepping stones that we hit along the way. And these, these three words are unbelief, rebellion, and perversion. Unbelief, rebellion, and perversion. So let's begin in verse 5. Though you already know this, I wanted to remind you. In today's text, Jude is expanding his comments in verse, from verse 4 into verse 5, and he tells us again why he's writing. He's saying, I want to remind you. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the, the Bible is full of calls to remember. We're, we're called to remember the Lord and all his ways he has led us. Deuteronomy 8, verse 2 uh, uh, we're, we're called to, to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, Exodus 20 verse 8. And in particular, as Christians, we're, we're commanded to remember the Lord and the Lord's death at the communion table until he comes. That's 1 Corinthians. But Jude says, now look, what I'm getting ready to tell you, you already know. I'm not telling you something you, you haven't heard before from Jesus. I, I'm not telling you something that you haven't heard before from, from Paul. I'm not telling you something you haven't heard before from Peter. I'm not telling you something you haven't heard before from the other apostles. You can find my teaching in Jesus' teaching, in, in Paul's teaching, in, in Peter. I'm not here to tell you something new. I'm here to remind you of something you've already heard. Jude is asking these Christians to remember. He's asking us to remember. And, and here's the powerful thing about remembering things, like memory. Our memories interpreted rightly lead to right responses. Let, let me give you an example. We, we remember the Titanic. My son recently has been really enamored with the 
tragedy of the Titanic and the fact that there wasn't enough lifeboats on it. Well, we remember that, and those who build boats today remember back to the tragedy of the Titanic, and therefore today they make sure there's always enough lifeboats to cover all those who would be on board. Something in the past has made them remember something important that they apply to the present. It impacts what they do today. And Jude's calling them to remember in the same way. Jude is not writing to introduce his readers to something they've never known, but he's writing to remind them of something they must never forget. And Jude here is reminding them that what is currently happening, which is he's referred to in verses 3 and 4, has always led to God's judgment. Jude proceeds to give three Old Testament examples of God's judgment against sin. And and Jude does this as a warning against those who who falsely profess faith, who who change the content of the gospel, who, who reject the truth once and for all given, and who use grace as as an excuse for, for immorality. And this is what he's warning them against. Though you already know this, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. I'm sure you remember what story this is referring to. This is, of course, referring to to the story of the Exodus. You can see it in Exodus 13, and maybe between services today you can read that. The The day when the Lord, by the strong hand, brought all of his people out of the land of Egypt. I mean, it was amazing. They were led by a a pillar of cloud by day and and fire by night, and and they crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but but all the enemies of of the people of Israel were destroyed and drowned, and they saw them on the other side of the shore. God led them out with a mighty, mighty hand. And that's what they experienced. It was amazing to witness the, the reality of God's redeeming power. And I want you to notice who does the rescuing. Who does the rescuing of the Israelites uh, uh, from Egyptian slavery? It says in Deuteronomy 5 or 6 that Yahweh, the covenant Lord of Israel, saved them, saved his people from Egypt. And Jude, he says, it was the Lord Jesus Christ. That Jesus, the second member of the Trinity, present in pre-carnate form, as we find him so many other times throughout Scripture in the Old Testament, he is the only Savior. He is our only Savior. And yet, what does Jude says happen? What does Scripture say happen? What did Jesus do? It says, but later destroyed those who did not believe. The very same people who were saved and redeemed from Egypt were later destroyed for their unbelief. Now this is referring to the story that, boys and girls, you probably know of the 12 spies. Maybe you know the song, 12 men went to spy on Canaan, 10 were bad and 2 were good. That song? Well, we won't, because of time, go back and read that account. But if you remember, if you remember from from church or you remember from studying at home or or having devotions with your parents, you'll remember that the 12 spies came back and they gave the exact same account. The report of the majority, the 10 who were bad, and the report of the minority, the two that were good, was precisely the same report. The land was a land flowing with milk and honey, which is the same report. However, the majority said, nevertheless. And the others, the two, said, we're able to go in. Same report, but different individuals gave it. And the difference 
What is to be found in the individuals who gave the report? And what does our text tell us? It says that they did not believe. The problem with the ten bad spies was they did not believe. And the people of Israel joined in their unbelief. And what was God's response? In Numbers it says, Numbers 14, None of the men who have seen my glory and the signs that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and yet have put me to the test these ten times and have not obeyed my voice shall see the land that I swore to give to their fathers. And none of those who despise me shall see it. And Jude diagnoses the problem and says their problem was unbelief. And that's the first word I asked you to remember today. Unbelief. But continuing on, and the angels who did not keep their position of authority but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment to the great day. And this is a second example is, is, is well, the fallen angels. The angels that are spoken of in Scripture, where it says, And the great dragon was thrown down, the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. What these angels sought to do is they, they sought a station and a position which God had not given to them leaving their dignity of their angelic position, the, these individuals fell further than they would have ever imagined. And so they left their proper place, their assigned spot, and they crossed the divinely appointed boundaries to, to exalt themselves. They sought to exalt themselves to be like the Most High, and they left their own habitation of the world. The Word of God warns us of this. They abandoned their proper home. And they burned their bridges in rebellion. And they came to earth. And as a result of that, God has reserved them since they didn't keep their own domain. He now keeps them in their in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day, as Jude says. And this is basically an argument from, from greater to less, for the state of the angels is higher than ours, and yet God punished their defection and their rebellion in this dreadful manner. He will punish us if we too rebel and depart from the grace unto which he has called us. Their problem was rebellion. And that's the second word that I asked you to remember. Unbelief and rebellion. And Jude thus continue, In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example to those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Brothers and sisters in Christ, Sodom and Gomorrah is an example to us. Boys and girls, maybe you haven't heard the story. I'll take a moment just to read this one. In Genesis 19, what has happened is the Lord has sent angels to go speak to Lot, who's in Sodom, and as they go to visit him, this is what happens. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man surrounded the house. These angels are in the house of Lot. And it's saying every man, everybody to the last man is surrounding this house. And they called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them to, out to us that we may know them. Lot went out to the man at the entrance, shut the door after him and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who have not known any man. Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, Stand back. And they said, This fellow came to sojourn, and, and he has become the judge. Now we will deal worse with you 
then with them. Then they pressed hard against the man, Lot, and drew near to break the door down. But the men reached out their hands, this would be the angels, and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck with blindness the men who were at the entrance of the house, both small and great, so that they wore themselves out, groping for the door. Men so lost to their perversion that in their blindness still grope to find the door that they might enter in to abuse these men. This is the story Jude brings out. Unbelief, rebellion, and perversion. Jude's ultimate point for these three examples is that Judgment is inescapable. These people who have crept in, these individuals who are perverting the gospel, uh, endorsing unbelief, promoting sin, and, and cultivating rebellion, these, the things which they are doing have always led to God's judgment. God's judgment is inescapable. His patience is not unlimited, and God will always have the last word. And these warnings were meant for us as well. These warnings were not only for those who have crept in. Unbelief, rebellion, and perversion are always judged. And I want you to notice something. There's, there's, there's a trail going on here. that uh, uh, Unbelief leads to rebellion, and rebellion leads to perversion. It, 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 I want you to notice the parallel the parallelism that we see with Romans 1, that slippery slope. In Romans 1 where it says this, For all that they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking and foolish in their hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. They, they exchanged the glory of the mortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their heart to impurity and, and the dishonoring of their bodies amongst themselves because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions for their women exchanging natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and that men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty of error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteous evil, covetousness, malice, they are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Doesn't, doesn't there seem to be a parallel between Jude and Romans? And doesn't Romans 1 describe our current culture? And I would hope it's not the case, but does it that describe you? Has your unbelief led to rebellion? And has your rebellion led you into perversion? Immorality. Remember, as Jude says, God's judgment is inescapable. And this brings me to what I stated at the beginning of the service. Johnny Cash was right. He's saying this, you can run for a long time, you can run for a long time, sooner or later God's going to cut you down, go tell the long Tongued liar, go tell the midnight rider, tell the rambler, gambler, and backbiter, tell them that God's going to cut them down. And so today I would say, do not deceive yourself. 
you cannot outrun God's judgment. And so young people, being part of the visible covenant people of God is, is no guarantee of eternal security unless it's combined with a living personal faith in the Lord Jesus. Remember, as Jude says, remember. Remember what scripture has taught you. If, if you've forgotten, at least remember what Jude says to us today. On one occasion, God acted, acted decisively in history to save people. But that did not mean that they were immune from later judgment. And accordingly, God later executed judgment on Israel for their sins of unbelief in the desert. And he destroyed the very people he took out of Egypt. He destroyed the very angels who once were around his throne. And he destroyed the people of Sodom and Gomorrah who were opposed to him and perverted themselves. And these warnings are not only for false teachers. The angels had the blessings of heaven and the Israelites had the, the blessings of the church and Sodom had all the blessings of the world, of humanity, but God cut them down. The angels lost heaven, the unbelieving Israelites were shut out of Canaan and, and the Sodomites were, together with the fruitful land, destroyed. Calvin once said this, so long as we are without Christ and separated from him, nothing which he suffered and did for the salvation of the human race is of the least benefit to us. Unbelief will keep you from Christ, and unbelief will keep you out of heaven. And in that state of unrepentant rebellion, God is going to cut you down. Rebellion against God is always met by judgment, a judgment that is entirely righteous and, and entirely necessary. We, we kind of live in a culture where everyone wants to paint him or herself as a victim of circumstances and, and elicit sympathy from others, but no one wants to own up to being a responsible agent of hurt or evil. And the Bible rejects this attitude as self-deception. If we claim to be without sin, we, we deceive ourselves and the truth isn't in us. And so you have a choice. You can either going to, you're either going to love your sin or you will love Christ. You're either going to turn back to God in repentance and faith or you won't. In every area of life, in every moment of every day, God is demanding you. He's not demanding things from you. He's demanding you. He called you because he loves you. And true love and judgment are, are perfectly compatible. And God would not be a God of love unless he also was a God of judgment. And he loves us, therefore he gives warning of judgment. And so why does God's word have to contain so many warnings? Have you ever thought about that? And the answer is that Christ keeps his people. The warnings are, are one of the means by which God preserves his people until the end. Those who ignore his warnings neglect the very means God has appointed for, for salvation. Those who are God's people demonstrate their genuineness of their salvation by responding to the warnings given. The way in which we continue to keep ourselves in the love of God in essence is that we heed his warnings and we trust his promises. And you must allow the warnings to be warnings. Every time we come across a warning, don't think, well, that couldn't possibly be me. Of course it could. The warnings are there, and the promises are there, and when we neglect them, we neglect the means that God has appointed in order to keep us all the way to the end, to keep us all the way to the end of this journey so that, so that we're not like those who perished in the wilderness. The Lord Jesus is, is a friend of sinners, and he will forgive and never turn away any who come to him. We look back to the great deliverance of the cross. We look forward to the day we can stand before him. We look at his warnings, and we look at his promises, and we believe both, and we live accordingly. 
what a glorious and wonderful thing. There is grace to be found in the warnings that we see in Scripture. I can think of no better way to end our message today than to, than to look at the end of the letter we now consider. Then we looked at the, the benediction that Jude gave where he says, now to him who is able to keep us from stumbling and to, to present us blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory and majesty, dominion and authority before all time, now and forever. And we can all say amen to that because we heed his warnings and we believe his promises. And we know that he has promised to keep us to the end. Amen? Amen? Let us stand together. We're going to worship the Lord in song in response to the word we've heard today. We're going to sing Psalm 15a.